My name is Dr. Kevin Pekka. I want to make a podcast that exposes people to the true miracles of life and health. All the guests on this show have been specially picked because they bring something positive to the world. They have some of the most amazing and inspiring life stories. These people have a passion for living, healing, and leaving the world better than they found it. There is something inside these people that made them keep fighting through all the tough times, even when people told them it was not possible. They carried on and made their lives beautiful again. And now they are sharing their experiences with the world. This is the Expect Miracles podcast. Enjoy the show. Keith Primo is a former NHL star drafted third overall in the 1990 NHL draft. He captained two NHL teams, the Carolina Hurricanes and the Philadelphia Flyers. Keith was also an Olympic athlete for Team Canada in the 1998 Olympics and an NHL All-Star. Today, Keith has a foundation for concussion awareness and educates players on post-concussion syndrome and the different treatment options available to help people suffering with concussions. Please welcome Keith Primo. All right, Keith, where are you from? Originally, I'm from Canada. I'm just born and raised just outside of Toronto uh, in a town called Whitby. And were you, uh, were you born on skates or? <laughs> My name is Dr. Kevin Pekka. I want to make a podcast that exposes people to the true miracles of life and health. All the guests on this show have been specially picked because they bring something positive to the world. They have some of the most amazing and inspiring life stories. These people have a passion for living, healing, and leaving the world better than they found it. There is something inside these people that made them keep fighting through all the tough times, even when people told them it was not possible. They carried on and made their lives beautiful again. And now they are sharing their experiences with the world. This is the Expect Miracles podcast. Enjoy the show. Keith Primo is a former NHL star drafted third overall in the 1990 NHL draft. He captained two NHL teams, the Carolina Hurricanes and the Philadelphia Flyers. Keith was also an Olympic athlete for Team Canada in the 1998 Olympics and an NHL All-Star. Today, Keith has a foundation for concussion awareness and educates players on post-concussion syndrome and the different treatment options available to help people suffering with concussions. Please welcome Keith Primo. All right, Keith, where are you from? Originally, I'm from Canada. I'm just born and raised just outside of Toronto uh, in a town called Whitby. And were you, uh, were you born on skates or <laughs> been skating ever, ever since you can remember? Pretty much. Started skating when I was four and started playing organized hockey when I was five. So we played for a long time. Yeah. Were you into any other sports growing up or was it just strictly hockey? No, I actually I was afforded the opportunity to basically try whatever I wanted. I, I played do- lots of different sports. I tried uh, different instruments and the other sports I guess I played. I played like, some lacrosse growing up, played rugby and volleyball in high school, but they all kind of dropped off as I continued to pursue a hockey career. Yeah, well, rightfully so. How old were you when you realized that uh, you really had a a gift with hockey and that you could definitely uh, do something with it? I think it was when I was 15 and and I was drafted to Canadian Major Junior Hockey League to the Ontario Hockey League and I was drafted by the Hamilton Steelhawks and you know I was just like every other kid growing up in Canada the dream was to play in the National Hockey League but the reality was what we watched on TV on Saturday night and and so just kind of had an epiphany when I was drafted to major junior and realized that at that point, you know what, this could be a reality. And I really began pursuing that goal. So you began playing in the OHL at like 15, 16? I was 15 when I started wow. playing. So was that a big jump for you? It was because I came out of major Bantam double A. So I was only playing double A hockey at the time. And, you know, I, I dealt with my challenges, but uh, I also had three years eligibility before my draft year. So uh, I had lots of time to develop. So you had a, a good career in the OHL? Three years, all with the same franchise. The first year was with Hamilton, and the franchise then moved to Niagara Falls, where I spent my second and third year. My third year, I ended up winning the league scoring race, which was my draft year, and it kind of catapulted me into the draft and into my first year pro. And who drafted you? I was drafted by the Detroit Red Wings. Wow, okay. And so were you going to the NHL around 18, 19 too? So, yes, I, the same year I was drafted, was, I graduated from major junior, and I played my first year of pro as an 18-year-old. Wow, that's impressive. I mean, I have a question for you, too, because you see a lot of talented hockey players, and sometimes the most talented kids you grew up playing with don't make it. What was it for you? Was it mindset that brought you all that way? What do you think it was that carried you to that elite level? I think there's a couple 
factors and, and certainly mindset is one of them because you're correct in stating that a lot of great players when they're younger never fulfill their ambitions but a lot of times just it's just natural course of evolution and other times it's getting sidetracked by uh just life in general and so it take, you know it takes a, a determined individual to continue to persevere especially with their goal of playing a professional sport and even still it doesn't guarantee even if you are a persistent individual that your dreams and aspirations will come true but you definitely need that quality if you're going to attempt it for sure and were you firing on all cylinders when you made it to the NHL or did you hit a couple of speed bumps where you're like, oh, what's going on here? Yeah, no, I had some speed bumps for sure. My first year, I was in and out of the lineup as an 18-year-old. And, and my second year, I actually was sent down to the minors or I played half the year. And so the first two years of my pro career were definitely a challenge. It wasn't until my third year where I started to kind of hit my stride and and really develop into a everyday NHLer. And from that point on, I probably had 12 or 13 really good years in the National Hockey League and part of my life I look back on fondly. Definitely. So, Keith, when did you start experiencing some of uh, your concussion issues? I mean, we both grew up getting hit in the head our entire lives, but when did you notice, oh, I this is definitely my first concussion? Or So I can't look back and say when my first concussion is. And, you know, I'm often asked, I'm amazed with, with players who played in my year who actually have the ability to recollect how many concussions they've actually had dating back to when they first started playing. But, you know, when I get asked the question, I, I have four documented concussions, but the number is north of 10. And I, I don't know where that number falls. But to know where I kind of felt like the first, real first one that kind of started to impact my health was in the summer of 96 at the uh, World Cup. I circled in a neutral zone and I ran into a big gentleman named Eric Lindros. And we were on the same <laughs> team. And, oh, really? Yeah. And I had my first documented concussion that season, actually, in Hartford playing for the Hartford Whalers in 97. I think it was probably January, February, 97. And I think it was due to the hit I had the previous summer. I'd never really fully recovered. And, and I look back on that year and I had a lot of issues that now make a lot more sense. And so that was probably where the, in the first one that I can recollect as having an impact on my health. Yeah. What were some of those symptoms you went through after that hit? It just lethargy and brain fog and just feeling of just kind of always not having the, the same kind of energy level that I normally had or you'd th expect to have as a professional athlete. And I literally remember feeling that summer, now we're in the summer 97, my brain actually settling when I wasn't doing anything, sp spent the summer at home and just kind of the, re the rest allowed my symptoms to subside and I felt good again. But now I'm starting down that slippery slope of injuries. Right. So you got that hit and then was it a couple seasons later you experienced it again or was it the next season? Yeah, no. So my second documented concussion happened in the spring of 2000, my first year with the Philadelphia Flyers and playing in the playoffs. And similar, all, all my hits, all four of my documented concussions were very similar. Three of them were through the neutral zone. The fourth one was in the defensive zone, but all of them were open ice with direct hit to the head. With, you know, which today's game is, is the suspension and there's a lot less of because they protect the head, which is, which is obviously a key component of protecting the players. But anyways, I was hitting the neutral zone and uh, stretchered off the ice, stayed in the Pittsburgh hospital overnight and ended up ultimately playing two nights later in the, in the first game of the conference finals against the New Jersey Devils. On reflection, that was probably for me after saying the first one was I'm recognizing that as the beginning. This was probably the beginning of the demise because this was this one I definitely I knew better and I didn't manage it properly. And did you uh, lose consciousness? So I don't think I did, but from the time of the hit to the time I, I noticed somebody, it's the trainer standing over top of me. So I might have for a few seconds, but you know, I don't ever feel like any of my concussions I, where I blacked out, but that probably is the one where if I was to say that I was out for a few seconds, that would be the one. So you continued uh, playing in that. Were you able to finish the series? We beat out Pittsburgh. We started against New Jersey and I finished out the season, or sorry, finished out the, the playoffs against uh, New Jersey, who we eventually lost to in seven games, but I played all seven games and it went into the summer and again, rest and recovery, but I just didn't manage it properly. At that time they were doing baseline, they started doing baseline, impact baseline testing. And I had, um, in between game six against Pittsburgh and game one against New Jersey, I obviously had to go see the neurologist who was a lovely lady and, and she took me in and she uh, administered the baseline. And I prepared all day. I focused all night and all day to take the test. And we'd done it enough times that kind of knew what was coming. And so I was able to pass my baseline and she sat across her desk from me and she said, well, there's nothing I can do to keep you from playing Keith, but please be careful. 
And she had a very serious look on her face and I kind of chuckled uh, like, you know, I, she knew what I was doing. I knew what she was saying. And I walked and how out. Old, of, how old are you at this point? So that was 2000. I was 29. Okay. And are you, are you captain of the Flyers at this point? N- not yet. Not yet. Okay. So that was coming in the couple. So you still had a lot of hockey. It's still, yeah. I mean, 29 years old. I, I wasn't even 30 yet. And I walked out of her office and I walked onto the street in downtown Philadelphia and I had the blistering headache. So I didn't heed the signs or the warnings, but and proceeded to play. But again, impact baseline testing is vital. I, I feel it's any parent who's going to put their kid in sport and certainly contact sport should have baseline testing. But there are it's it's only one safeguard, right? And it's important that uh, not only get impact baseline, but you get clearance and you get seen by proper medical professionals in order to get cleared to play. Yeah. Now, did all your symptoms settle after the off season, after that one? And were you good to go for the next season or you were just pushing through it? No, I was good to go. And you know, the recovery on that was probably probably a four to six week window. And now it's now the period of time between recovery is, or I sense it right now. I know it's the time period is growing and that, which led to my third documented concussion in 2004. It was again, similar. It was a little bit earlier. It was a February, it was not too long after the All-Star break. Uh, I was in Madison Square Garden and I turned to the neutral zone and I was blindsided uh, in the neutral zone by Bobby Holik. And I didn't, th- didn't think it was terrible when I got to the bench and just didn't feel right. And I left the bench and went in the training room and the doctor and the team trainer said, you know, you're done for the night. I think at that point it's the third period. And I, said I felt I felt fine. I return home and I get home and my wife tells me that I don't look right. And I, I'm almost argumentative that I, I'm fine. Yeah. I, I feel fine. And it was a Thursday night. We had a Saturday home game. I'm in the car driving on my way to uh, the rink for a Saturday afternoon home matinee. And I get motion sick. I I never had. I can't focus. I can't. I feel sick. I'm nauseous. I get to the Starbucks down the street and I call the trainer and I tell him I don't feel well. And he says, tells me to turn around and go home. And that was the beginning of documented concussion number three, of which I now missed six weeks and forced myself back into the lineup just in time for the playoffs. Probably not fully recovered. Which again was very dangerous, and did it affect the way you were playing? Like, uh, were you more cautious going into corners and everything, or you were? Just- I think it's interesting because 2004 was a tremendous playoff run for me, and I think what it did was it made me much more acutely aware. Like, I had to really focus on on everything. So, yeah, day, game day, I had to be make sure I was focused and prepared because I was afraid to get hit. And I had to really focus on the play. I had to focus on the puck. And, and so I played really well. <laughs> and it didn't impact my game then. You know, that impact didn't come until later. So you got three documented now. And then so this season ends? The season ends and we and we go into the lockout. The lockout year, which was good for me because now I've had three documented concussions. And I'm starting to feel the effects of it. Not to the point where I, I'm, I'm concerned or I'm worried. Right. Figuring the, the lockout would give me an opportunity to, again, heal, rest, and recover. And uh, to come out of the lockout in the fall of 2005, and we start the season and we're nine games in and we're up in Montreal. And same thing, I puck comes off the goalie's pads on a penalty kill. And I turn up ice and a guy's coming in for the rebound and he, he runs over me and I catch it in the side of the head. And I'm down for a second and kind of basically checking to see how I feel and Felt okay. And again, third period's close to the end of the game. Trainer sends me off and I get on the bus afterwards and I call my parents and my wife and I, I tell them both that I'm actually excited. I feel fine. I feel good. And I was waiting for that next big hit and I felt like I handled it only to 24, 48 hours again. I start to regress and start to have the blurred vision, the nausea, the lethargy. That was documented concussion number four and, and a long time to recover after that one. And was that your final year? That ends up being, so that was October 2005. I fought all year to return to the lineup. I worked on my own, on the ice, off the ice, end up missing the entire season. I returned in the end of the summer 2006, and I'm on the ice skating with got with a group of guys. And after the skate, I walk into the trainer's office, and I sit down, and I say, I feel good, you know, another week or two, and I'll be right there, and I'm definitely feeling better. And he looks at me, and he says, well, I appreciate your effort, Keith, but good conscience, I'll never be able to let you play again. And at that point, my career was over. And that story I I appreciate because the culture that we grew up in is just, it's different, the mindset. And and today it's 
much better. You know, courage then was playing through those type of injuries. To me, courage today is the ability to say, listen, I'm, I'm hurt. I don't feel right. I, I need help. And then the second part was that if the trainer didn't tell me he wouldn't clear me or wouldn't wouldn't give me let me play again, I would have just kept trying. And so I, I'm indebted to the therapist, the athletic therapist Jim Crossan, who recognized that uh, putting my health in in jeopardy. So were you almost relieved at that point, or were you angry or upset, or how did, what was going on there? Yeah, so I, I got in the car and I started driving home, and my first sense was that of relief. And the disappointment of not being able to play, again, didn't hit me until later. But it was an impactful moment in my life and a lot of different emotions. But the strongest emotion was a sense of relief, yeah. And so what were the next year or two like? What were you experiencing with the concussions and all that? Yeah, so so the fact that I retired was one thing. It kept me out of harm's way playing the sport. Just because you retire, the symptoms don't go away. And so it was a long journey. It was the better part of seven years before I actually felt some semblance of normalcy. And I look back on that seven years of my life and it, it's really a blur. My kids were at a young age and spent a lot of time with them. And I coached them, my boys playing hockey. But it's a stretch of my life where it just kind of flew by. Like I, I don't remember a whole lot. And I spent, a, I was afforded the opportunity to see you know, whatever doctor I wanted to or needed to. And I was traditional to non-traditional to basically whatever you could think might work. And, and the reason I did that was because I always knew what normal felt like. I didn't want to lose that. I, knew I wanted to get back to that. And there was something out there that was going to help me get to that point. And I was close to giving up hope, but I was some things eventually worked out for me and, and allowed me to, to heal. Yeah. What route did you go first to try uh, to get on the path of recovery? I blended a lot. I, it wasn't just you know, a period of time where I was seeing one type of specialist or therapist. I tried Reiki and I tried acupuncture and I tried massage and cranial sacral and chiropractic. And I would say that the one mainstay was, was probably chiropractic because I, I knew a lot of my difficulty was coming from occipital, up, upper cervical. Uh, the one th treatment that ultimately helped me the most was a treatment called prolotherapy and dr. i had greenberg. dr greenberg which i had, had had my greatest success more recently kind of had a relapse a few years ago i hit my head on a door jam in a locker room and uh what's helped me through that is atlas orthogonal so that's kind of what i do i just don't use the instrument I do the okay. upper cervical technique, but it's called Blair, okay. and it's done by the hand. Atlas Orthogonal, they use the sound waves, right? Correct. The machine? Correct. That's a upper, another upper cervical technique, yeah. Where is your office located? It's in Montclair, New Jersey. You're up in Montclair, okay. Yeah, actually West Orange now. We just moved this week, so. Oh, okay. Which is further south, right? Is uh, West Orange further south than Montclair? So office was about a mile and a half away from each other. Okay. They border each okay. other, so they're, they're right. We're about 12 miles northwest of New York City. Okay. So we're like yeah, exit 148 yeah. off the park. Off, the, but. off the Garden State, right. Yeah. Okay. So you've been going to an Atlas Orthogonal guy? Dr. John Sandos in Moorestown. Yeah. Great. That's great. I've had some success with that and it's allowed me to feel better as well. Great. Great. So you have a foundation now, right? Yeah. Explain to us what your foundation is about. When I played, I was involved, I was an ambassador for Shoot for a Cure. Shoot for a Cure is a hockey offshoot of CSRO, ASRO, Canadian Spinal Research, American Spinal Research Organizations, and they raise funds for spinal cord injury. And when I went through my ordeal, because of my relationship with them, they created an offshoot for neurotrauma called Play It Cool. And as we did the Play It Cool program, and we spoke around the country, what we came to realize was that brain injury or concussion or neurotrauma wasn't hockey centric or sports specific but it was it crossed all walks of life and after speaking we'd have the little old lady who would walk up and say you know i bent over and i hit my head on the counter or hit my head on the door and i suffered concussion and I, one that was alarming to us but two uh, it was powerful and so and then what we also found was that people were being diagnosed with their injury or injury was occurring and they didn't know where to turn. Tremendous amount of anxiety associated with injury to themselves or injury to a child or injury to a family member. And we created stopconcussions.com, which is an online portal. My partner, Kerry Goulet, the mastermind, and he's heavily involved in the day to day and he does all the speaking engagements, was created to develop an information portal where people could go and research and find information that might help them. We, we didn't steer anyone towards any one specific therapy or treatment, try and give them a whole host of avenues that they could try, as well as 
just general information that would help. It's amazing to me still, I, I believe there's been a cultural mindset, especially in our sport, in the game of hockey, but there's still such a long way to go. And then for me, the medical profession, it's still so far behind. Like I know kids in college who they go to the team physician, including my daughter, and she's told nobody's ever missed school because of a concussion or you'll be fine, you can take class. And when in reality, those are some of the most dangerous things that they can present to her. So there's a long way to go, but we're, you know, we're certainly, we're making headway and it's, it's important to continue to get the message out there. Yeah, well, I mean, that's so important what you're doing specifically, because even in my case, it took me four years to find any type of hope. And you would go tell the doctor, oh, my hands are shaking. They're not right. And they would put you on seizure medication. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, I'm depressed. I'm not a depressed person. I'm just, I just don't feel right. And then the antidepressants would come. And so I was all drugged up and I just, it made me almost feel worse. And that one day I called you, I got your number from Kevin Harding and That was one of the worst days of my entire life. And I almost gave up that day and I called you and I can't thank you enough of just sitting down and talking to me for 10, 15 minutes. Just It was nice to talk to somebody that's been through the same thing and know what to say because I would call my mom and she'd be like, Kevin, I love you, but I I don't know what to do for you right now. We've been doing everything and it's just so difficult. And there's so many kids that go through that. I have patients that they don't hear about upper cervical or any other technique until like four or five years later. And it's a shame. So what your website and foundation and everything is doing is just an amazing outlet for so many people. And that's just truly amazing. So thank you. Yeah, no, and thank you. And I, and I was the one thing when I played too, like people would say, reach out to guys who are former players that have had to deal with the same issue. And I'm like, what, what's the sense? They're going to tell me that they have a concussion. I already know I have a concussion. But the level of comfort when I eventually did reach out to them, it is unfortunate community. And I always explain to people, you you just don't know until you have to deal with it yourself. You can never tell. And and so it's important that I share the message and and you practice what you're practicing. And we continue to help the community that we're an unfortunate part of. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And if there's anything I could do to help out with that uh, foundation, I would love to, uh, if there's any speaking or anything, I would love to share my story and just help out as many people going through that well, that's great. We'll take you up on it and I'll, I'll talk to Kerry and I'll, I'll have him uh, reach out to you. Yeah. Cause they, um, again, it's all about the messaging. It's all about the education and, and it's important that we continue to, to share the, the little bit of wealth that we know. And, uh, Keith, are you still coaching hockey or? So I'm not. I coached my boys. At the, they played uh, Tier 3 Junior on the East Coast before they went out to the USHL last year. And I stopped coaching for a couple of reasons. One, I wanted to follow them. And two, I, did, you know, I wanted to see if it was something that I really wanted to pursue or if I was re- really just doing it because the boys were involved. And I miss it at times, but I, not enough to businesses that I'm involved with in the day-to-day and chasing my kids around. So that's enough for now. Well, Keith, thank you so much. I really appreciate you coming on and just thank you for everything that you've done for me and everybody else. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you everyone for listening. My private practice is located in New Jersey at Montclair Upper Cervical Chiropractic. If you have any additional questions about today's podcast, other episodes, or any questions about Blair Upper Cervical Chiropractic in general, feel free to visit my website at drkevinpecka.com or subscribe to my YouTube channel at Dr. Kevin Pekka. Hope you enjoyed the show. Cheers.